This is the Voir Dire Podcast. In this episode, a conversation with a former client found not guilty of murder. And now your host, attorney Scott Reich. We have an interesting guest here today, a former client of the Reich Law Firm, uh, Leland. And Leland was in a very difficult situation uh, through not a whole lot of uh, uh, series of uh, unfortunate events that he did not necessarily plan or put himself into uh, directly. But he was ultimately charged with uh, first-degree murder. And after a trial, he was found not guilty and uh, good for him. He was able to go on and have a successful business. He already had a business prior to uh, the charge uh, that he had. He nearly lost everything while he was sitting in custody. And uh, since then, he's never been in trouble since, not even a speeding ticket. Uh, but he's continued to grow his business. And um, now he's going to deal with some other life uh, events going on right now. But uh, Leland, how are you? I'm um, good. Thanks for asking, Scott. All right. So what I want to talk about, and maybe you can really bring this in for people to understand, is um, yeah, I think most people, if they get in trouble in the criminal justice system, it's probably a traffic ticket or, or something along those lines. And here you are, you know, somebody that had a couple of minor brushes with the law, but no big deal. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're being charged with first degree murder looking at spending the rest of your life in prison for something that you and I both knew you didn't do. What, uh, what, what was going through your head? Let's kind of just start from the beginning. Like you're there and next thing you know, there's a dead body. What was going through right. your head? Right. Well, initially, um, it is it, very surreal. Um, um, it, it, Everything in the, the beginning just tended to just slow down. Your life literally just stops. And, of course, the natural reaction is, uh, is to want to attain attorney. Um, emotionally, you want to know, ex you know, why, why you're going through this. Why is this happening to me? You know, what did I do? And what a lot of people tend to do is they want to get it, get it resolved in, quickly. Okay. Um, that's, um, a good, that's a good point. Yeah. They Cause... want it to go away tomorrow. Um, and, I, and I think that a lot of times when you, you know, you're locked up or you're under suspicion or um, you're being charged with something, you're looking for, uh, you're looking for an attorney or a person that's just going to sort of wave that magic wand and make this go away. And so those are the, um, you know, those are a lot of the emotions that are that that come up in the beginning. At least for me, it's just, you know, I was like, who can fix this? Who can save me? Who can? who can uh, make this go away. And uh, it just doesn't unfold. That's just not simply the reality, and it just doesn't unfold that way. And that's interesting. Obviously, your first thought or reaction, I think you said, was get an attorney. Right. Right? And I think when we first spoke, um, your initial reaction was, well, I need to go in there and tell them what happened. Correct. And I think I told you, not if you want me to represent you or something to that effect, right? Absolutely, right. Because we were still investigating the case. Right. We were trying to figure out what was going on. Right. Um, and I still remember your case. I remember literally sitting in bed on a Sunday morning, and they had news crews out at this right. particular <laughs> scene. And I remember my first thought, you know, as a criminal defense attorney is, huh, maybe I'll get that case. Right. <laughs> and... You ultimately came and you, uh, we talked and you, and you retained me. And I remember turning you in at the jail and letting everybody know you have an attorney. Do not talk to my client. Right? Exactly. That's exactly what happened is um, um, you met me there um, and you wanted to let the people that were taking me into custody that I was retained and that no, uh, no one was allowed to question or talk to me in any sort of capacity about my case and well you know in anything related to this case and um um you're pretty stern about that and, and it was and i really appreciate it because um it wasn't a situation where it's like well lee you got to turn yourself in sooner or later it was just like lee 
the faster you get in there, the faster we can get the ball rolling. Um, if you need me to come in there and turn you in myself, um, I'll go with you and walk you through this. And that's pretty much what happened. I mean, we walk from day one, we walked through this entire process together and walked out together. Yeah. And I told you to keep your mouth shut Yep. and it's not going to get resolved overnight. Right. That's exactly what was said. And when I'm telling you to keep your mouth shut, that kind of went against your natural instinct of, well, I want to tell my side of the story. Right. Right. And, you know, there was a lot of people and a lot of people implicated and stuff. And you want to help other people and you want to get the story straight. And like you said, it was in the media. So a lot of the media had the story completely convoluted. It was not the truth. And you kind of want to get the, to the source of the rumor and try to dissolve the rumor as best you can. And I knew better than to go and talk to the police and just say, hey, I didn't do it or anything like that. But um, there is protocol when it comes to that, because when they say uh, what you say can be held against you in a court of law, they mean exactly that. And what they um, really should say is anything you say can be used against you, misconstrued, taken out of context, and completely twisted. Exactly, exactly. They they can play on words, and um, so it's a wide range of, of. You have to be really careful about what you say. Um, so it's best to have someone to say it for you. And um, Scott really it, it sort of embedded that in my brain. Is just like, let me do the talking. And because what I, what I also learned, like going through the process and going through the trial, is. Just because it's in the paperwork or just because it's in the, 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 your, your discovery or just because the police say one thing or the district attorney say one thing doesn't necessarily make it true and it doesn't necessarily make it evidence. Um, it's a story. And um, a, a lot of times, especially other defendants and people that I've learned and, and met along the way, they just automatically say, well, if it's written down, it must be true. I could be convicted of this or... Um, they're going to paint a picture as if I'm guilty because of what the documents say. And you know the truth and you know what transpired and you know what you did and did not do. So you got to kind of stick to your guns and let someone tell your story for you. And it doesn't, doesn't mean that you're innocent or guilty. It's just that in a court of law, it's, 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 um, that's exactly what it is. There's con you know, you are protected, um, by the constitution. And a lot of times you take away your rights by saying or doing too much. Um, I mean, you have a right to remain silent. Exactly. Why would that you give up your, your right? right unless you're going to get something in exchange for that? Exactly. Exactly. Um, you, you do have the right to remain silent. Um, you don't have to speak to anyone but your attorney. And, and why would you give up that right? And um, what I like about Scott is that he does, he's, he's good at teaching you about the Constitution and about the law and about the process as, you, as we go. And I think a lot of times defendants get a little frustrated because they don't know what's going on. And a part of that is because attorneys don't exactly relay that message. Um, some can be, you're just in, you know, you could be a number to some of these attorneys. And so um, me and Scott, I, I feel like we worked good as a team, even though I was the defendant and he was defending me is that, is that, the communicate we were able to communicate and um he was able to uh, and i felt like i was teachable and i could learn and i could understand what the process is and that really helped me to develop the patience as best i can because i'm facing a life-altering situation so well and i think i per as i recall it i never went in there and said other than you're going to keep your mouth shut right i never said you know uh i know everything you don't know anything uh Right. And so you just need to do whatever I tell wasn't you to do. He wasn't condescending at all. He, he just says, Lee, the less you say, the better chance we have. And I think that's really true, and I think that's okay with saying that. Um, a lot of times um, um, by you saying things and, you know, the, you know, the police and the district attorney aren't on your side. It's just what it is. And, and they're looking to paint a different type of picture, not how much – it doesn't matter – the, the background you have, your family background, and you know you have good upbringing and good ethics and good morals. They are trying to make you into something totally different, and so you do want to speak to the people that are really, truly, genuinely on your side, and uh, that is going to be your attorney and the team around you. Um, uh, it could be even misconstrued of talking to family members. Um, 
cellmates. Uh, well, let's talk about that. Yeah. Obviously, I told you when you go into custody, you're not going to talk to anybody. You're not going to talk to uh, the, the detectives. You're right. going to go through booking. You're going to tell them your name, rank, and serial right. number, so to speak. Right. And that's the extent of it. But I also, you know, tell you, like I told, tell every client, don't talk about the facts of your case with your cellmate, uh, your family members over the phone, because those are all recorded and downloadable these days. Right. And so really, here you are in an environment where everybody in there has their own story and everybody wants to know their own story. And sometimes there's people in there that want to use it for their own advantage. How difficult was that not to talk to somebody or say, hey, man, look at my discovery or, or anything like that? Naturally, when you know you have a lot of emotions, so you're looking to vent to anybody that's wanting to listen, especially if you feel like you're innocent. You know, you do want to talk to your mother or your brother or even your cellmate. Some people get closer to the cellmate and say, hey, man, I don't deserve to be here. Um, 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 this is the circumstances. What's in here is not true. This is the truth. And you get all of those feelings. And, you know, it takes a lot of discipline and uh, to to not say anything. And and when I tell you they pulled out all the stops throughout the process, they truly did. They they talked to other inmates to see if I had a story to tell. They talked to they pulled up every phone record I had for the 14 months that I were in there. I remember that they yeah. never give me a disc if it's right. They, well, they have to turn it over if they say right. it. But when they be in the government, the prosecution, right. the investigators. But normally there's something on there that's bad. Right. And in your particular case, I remember listening to all your phone calls right and you never brought up your case other than maybe your court appearance right and so you did listen you right. were you listened absolutely <laughs> because yeah. you want to give yourself a chance and and it's not about it's not about suppressing the truth or or, or hiding something this is really just protecting your right and then you know and you, i didn't want anything to get misconstrued or taken out of context and so um you know, it's it's not a sign of guilt because you want to keep your mouth shut. Um, it's just that um, you want to be able to tell the right story, and you want your story to be told the way you want it to be told. And you don't want it to be misconstrued or misinterpreted in any kind of way, and that's what they look to do. So let's talk a little bit about the fact when you're sitting there in custody and, you know, obviously, you, you know, you hadn't been in trouble you had a successful business going at the time various other right. ventures and what have you and all of a sudden here you are sitting in the what six by eight cell maybe right. a little bit larger maybe you're right. a cellmate maybe not and you know it's not like you can go home and see the family go to work talk right. about what's going on what kind of feeling is that sitting there basically waiting because obviously from the time you turned yourself in to the time your case was resolved was about a year, right? Yeah, it's about yeah, it's fourteen months. Fourteen months. Yeah, because when you get arrested, you know, you got to get discovery, do some investigation, set it for a preliminary hearing, right. arraignment, then they set a trial date, and you know that all got to continue. What's it like waiting, so to speak? Well, in the beginning, you want to quit. Uh, at the, the beginning, you're just you know, I, you know, I, I would be lying to say you know you you know you don't want to wake up in the morning. You you want to quit. You uh, um, it's very emotional uh, in the sense of um, in, in my situation, I have a lot of people that depend on me because I do run a business. Um, I am college educated, and a lot of people rely on me. And so this is very was also very embarrassing because. Um, in my community, my reputation was everything. So I was very concerned about my reputation. I was embarrassed, and, and I really wanted to just crawl up in a hole and die, um, especially because I knew the details of the case and what was being sort of fabricated was just, it was extremely exaggerated on what transpired and, and what happened. And so, um, I, um, <laughs> believe it or not, not, I felt like I was a victim of circumstances. So. Um, and my situation in the beginning was just, you know, you, you really just want to, you want to escape, you want to die, you, you know, you want to quit, you don't, um, and, and it's very difficult to accept your circumstances in the beginning. Um, it's, it's, it's depressing and it's, it can be very overwhelming and it get almost to the point where it can make you sick. Okay. Well, we, we got along pretty well. Yeah. And obviously, we get along pretty well now, even some almost 10 years later. Yeah. But, you know, 
we had our bumps along the road, did we not? I mean, you were frustrated that right. why is it taking so long? Right. Isn't it obvious that right. that uh, I didn't do anything? Why are they not dismissing this case? What kind of a lawyer are you? Right. Uh, what are you doing for me? Right. I seem to recall in having some of those conversations, right? Yes. Now, looking back, you know, I understand when you're there, yeah. you want to get it done. Right. You want to get it resolved. Why is it taking so long? I didn't do anything. Right. I need to get out of here. Right. Um, is that just frustration of, you know, being there? Like you said, your reputation, because it was in the newspaper. Every time we went to court, you were mentioned in court. Right. Um, and they usually got it wrong. I always wonder when you, you see something read in the paper and you read it and you think, were they at the same hearing that I was attending? Because that's not what happened at all. Exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, like I said, there's frustration. You talk about the loneliness, but right. you know, obviously I wasn't rushing down there every day to, you know, give you a, a you know, a, a pat on the back and say, everything's going to be okay. I'm pretty much, I'll come see you when we need to talk. But exactly. was that part of the frustration? That it is because what you see um, from a def defendant's point of view is um, time, the, the, the days and the time slow down. So when you're sitting there and you're faced with them sort of circumstances, it was an issue of um, you have all day, every day to think about where you're at and why you're there. And so a day to us uh, seems like a week. Um, a, a day to us as civilians seem like a week as a defendant or an inmate. And so um, you just sit and you think, and it, it, it almost can just, it, it drives you crazy because you're sitting there and you're just basically watching the second hand and wondering when am I going to come out of this or when am I going to get an answer or a result. And so the frustrating part is, and a lot of attorneys don't really probably have a hard time putting this in perspective, is no information is bad information. So when we're not keep up to breast about things and what's going on and, and, and you know, how the politics play in the courtroom um, when when you're a defendant and you're not really sure how the politics play out and why we're setting things over and why does the process take so long it gets very frustrating and then you start to have sort of this conspiracy attitude that everybody's against you and that your attorney must and be on a part of this and your attorney's a part of it and your attorney doesn't care about you or he's too busy working another case or um, um, he, you know, it's just one of those things like it, the best way I can convey it is that you really want your attorney to personalize it. And, 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 and sometimes it got very difficult. I mean, Scott is, um, he has other cases of course, but I do remember one thing that kind of resonated with me when I first retained him was he was like, Lee, I can't guarantee you anything. I can't guarantee you an outcome. I can't guarantee you how this is going to unfold. The only thing that I can guarantee is I'm going to work my butt off for you. And he was very resolute when he said it, and that's exactly what happened to, at the end. But what you don't see is, and what you do see, is you see the district attorney and all of the assistants and the judges and the court reporter being sort of the busybodies. And your attorney is kind of sort of the one who just kind of just sitting there, retaining all of the information, getting all of the study, coming up with the strategy. And, you know, Scott made, Scott never really explained his strategy, um, but he certainly had one. But because that strategy may change from day to day, week to week, month right. to month, depending on, you know, depending how on the information, information, right? So at one point, you know, we went up to court one time and, and, and the, you know, the district attorney was all fire and brimstone. He was, he was, you know, he just, he just looked lively in there and he just looked like full of spirit. And, I mean, just his body language alone and the way he spoke. It almost sounded like he was, I mean, he was sure he had this conviction. And Scott just kind of laid back and absorbed and took in the information. And, and, and he, you, know, he, he, you know, he said things when he needed to, but, you know, he didn't necessarily, you know, put on a show like you would see on a television show. You know, I didn't see, you know, you want to you see that out of your attorney. You want to see fire and brimstone and yelling and objections and things like that. And that's just simply not the case. And so I, I, this is the first time I ever, I never forget it because it was the first time I got upset at Scott and I was just like, I wrote him a letter and I was just like, man, you look shiftless in there. And I, I think that was the expression that I used. So, yeah, and, but and, looking back now, do you see is it more as a, um, it's not, it's almost like playing cards. You don't yeah. want them to see it. Like, don't let them see you sweat. You can't let them see you I don't care what you're saying. It doesn't matter. Prove it. Exactly. 
And, um, you know, of course, you're the one on the hot seat and you're the, the defendant. So, it, you know, it's hard to accept that, that, you know, right then and there. But um, looking back at it, that's exactly what happened. And, um, you know, Scott came and he was prepared with the one heck of a game plan. And I was even scared and I was what, what made me nervous is the first day of court, you have the you have two district attorneys. And I, I wasn't expecting that. And, you know, I kind of looked at Scott like, well, should we have two attorneys? Because it's two of them. I think you couldn't afford it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. But I, I remember the private investigator says, Lee, that it, that doesn't really matter. And he actually spoke very highly of Scott. And he said at the end of the day, uh, I don't know how to explain it, Lee, but, you know, when it comes to the judge, the district attorney, and everybody in this room, Scott's the smartest person in this room. Yeah, well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that that comes from the, Danny, the investigator, is that exactly how he explained it to me. And uh, But I couldn't see really the game plan. And so I thought that they were just going to sort of bully my attorney, so to speak. And, and it just wasn't the case. Um, Was that one of the first times we were in court, like for a preliminary hearing? I don't recall that exactly, but... Uh, well, you know, when you went to court, you know, you're, yeah. you're in shackles, you're sitting there in a little green yeah. or orange jumpsuit that they have down there in Arapahoe, I think yeah. it is. And, uh, uh, you know, what's it like seeing, so you know, your family's showing up and you're shackled and you've got belly chains on you and ankle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's that feeling like? Uh, you feel depleted. And again, like, you know, I'm a very prideful man and I, I work hard for what I have and, um, you do feel depleted and it, and it's embarrassing. And, um, uh, you really, in my case, I really didn't want family members and friends there. Um, because when you're faced with those sort of charges and circumstances, you look like a monster to other people, even to certain family members, you know, and, you know, they read, they read the papers and, and, and look at the news just as, as we do. And it's like, you know, they look at it and if it's in the paper, it must be true. Um, if it's on television, then it must be true. You're a monster. And uh, especially with with the sort of charge that I have, and it was actually first degree slash felony murder, which carried life without parole. And you know, you know, your family members, you know, or even friends or even associates are like, "Well, what did you do? You're not in here for any reason." And not being able to yeah, you didn't get your, here. You didn't get here for not doing something, right? You didn't get here. It for could not just doing be wrong something. place, wrong time. Exactly. And I remember my cousin coming to visit me, and 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 he was asking me all these questions. I was like, "You got to stop asking me questions." And he just was like, "Lena, what do you have to hide?" And it's like I'm, you know, and it's hard to explain and defend yourself when, when you're in face with those, sort of charges, and as embarrassing as those charges are. And you're knowing you're innocent. And I even had a co-defendant that was, that was innocent. And I even had an alibi. And you know I felt bad for him. And I, I remember telling Scott, I was like, Scott, I was like, you know, he's he's innocent. Like, you know, what do we do? How can we help him? You know, and I'm trying to help everybody. And it was, it was tough. I tell clients all the time that when you get in a situation like this excuse me, that you truly find out who your friends are. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, all your friends and people from, you know, wherever, what, were they putting money on your books? Would they come by to see you? Or was it just a few people here and there? You know, I come from a very strong, uh, uh, I, have, I have a very strong reputation in the community. And so I felt very supported in that regard. But I tell you, 99% of the people that were in there did not have that family support. They didn't have the money in their books. A lot of them were indigent. A lot of them, just to survive, would have to gamble or barter in some kind of way in order to um, just be able to sustain their daily activities in there. Um, the food isn't as great, so you have to have supplemental food or sort of income in there in order to just simply live and maintain. And, uh, you know, I did have a business, and I did have a strong family background, so I was able to 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 wing through it at the time, but my situation was very rare because that's just not the case nine times out of 10. Yeah. And so, like I said, no one was contributing to your defense fund. Cause as no. I recall, no, as I recall, you ran out of money. Yeah. We ran out of money. I had to ask the court to, yeah. to pay me basically to do the trial. Right. Um, and I stayed on, I, you know, probably would have done it 
regardless of, but it's nice to get paid a little something instead of working for free. Right. But, uh, I mean, that's a process. I mean, you still have obligations on the outside, trying right. to help people, uh, you know, your family, right. things of that yeah. business, try to keep it afloat. I remember right. you were trying to do that. Yeah. I lost my house in the process. Um, I lost um, a lot of assets during the time of this process. The only thing that I was able to hang on to by the, the th- you know, the thread of my teeth were was my business, um, which wasn't generating very much income at the time because, of course, I was incarcerated. Um, but, yeah, Scott came up with the plan, and once I ran out of money, he was able to um, make some adjustments and go to the court and obtain more funding. And, you know, forever grateful for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, I mean, your particular case, I use this as an example. I still have attorneys come up to me and... Um, say, man, I remember that case, murder case, and you didn't file any motions. Because right. I, I think that was another discussion that we had, yeah. which was, well, how can we not file in those motions? Where's that motion to dismiss? Right. And I'm like, well... You know, the infamous <laughs> motion to dismiss. <laughs> right. Yeah, it doesn't... It, uh, it's not there, you know what I mean? And right. I'm like, well, you didn't make a statement, so we have no motions to suppress. Right. Um, it's pretty much factually based. Right. I got what I need. They're not going to bring in 404B evidence. They've told me that. They didn't file any notice of it. Right. Um, and so each case is different. You right. know, looking back now, you've probably realized that, that, you know, I got a homicide case where I don't file any motions and I can have a routine DUI and I could have five motions or more. Right. It just depends on, on the, the cases. But that goes back to the whole point where you just being informed of what's going on. Right. Right. And, uh, but that's, I mean, that's tough. I mean, sitting there thinking 14 months in custody, not knowing yeah, you have court dates, but right. in between, what's my attorney doing? I mean, I think we tried to fill you in the best we could. Right. I know Danny, the investigator, went down to, right. uh, you know, talk with you. I would come down and, you know, let you know, hey, this is what's going on. And right. you know, a lot of times they're like, it's not factually complex. Right. Our, we're saying you had nothing to do with anything. And ultimately, they couldn't even show that you were there, um, you know, once it came to trial. So, you know, there wasn't like, like, what else should I be doing? Right. <laughs> All right, so we're back, and um, still talking to Leland about his case that he had almost some 10 years ago, and where we left off was kind of that unknown feeling of what's going on. You keep saying there's a strategy, like you didn't think there was a strategy, right? but oftentimes, I mean, it kind of changed literally because they had a witness that they said they were going to have, and they didn't, and that changed the whole complexion of everything about a week before trial. Do you recall that? I do recall that. I also recall... At one point, you were even considering putting me on the stand. Yeah. And um, that changed. Yeah, um, well, well, let's talk about that. So yeah. as you st- started getting closer to trial, yeah. and I don't recall off the top of my head, but I don't think there was ever even an offer made in your particular case, or maybe it was like 48 years or 60 years or something ridiculous, I think right? there was an offer made, but it was just like, yeah, something just absolutely just, you know, just, you know, it was something crazy. Yeah, and so it's like yeah, now we. I think can, it was thirty years. <laughs> yeah. Or so like think that. about it. Had you taken that deal, you'd still have a minute. You know, before you're even eligible for parole. Well, thirty, I guess you'd you'd maybe just about be eligible for parole these days. Right. Maybe getting right. close. Probably have another six years. Probably have another six years. Think about all the stuff you've done over the last. <clears throat> Nine ten. ten years. It's it's been a ride. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously we went to trial as we, as you got closer to trial, uh, what was that like? Is that, is that an emotional roller coaster? I've had other clients describe it as a complete emotional roller coaster. I can tell you for the attorney, as you get closer to trial on something serious as a, as a murder case where you, you know, attorneys, I know a lot of people think, oh, the attorneys, they don't care about me. They don't, they're just going to get paid and whatever, right. but I can tell you from the attorney perspective, it's stressful, okay? Absolutely. You, as the attorney, we make a lot of the decisions. You know, we decide what questions right. to ask, what witnesses to call, the strategy, the defenses. Because right. as the defendant, you have, you know, who my attorney's going to be. Right. Whether I'm going to uh, take a deal or not. Right. And whether you testify at trial. Those are your big questions. Obviously, you assist and you review the discovery and make points right. and suggestions, but um, I don't think people realize it, particularly people in custody. They think, oh, my attorney doesn't care about me. He's just thinking about getting paid. Right. 
And that's, I can tell you, that is the furthest thing from the truth. And when you realize that the questions that you ask or don't ask or how you present a question could be the decision that a juror hangs their hat on. You know, how, what was that answer? Did it come out okay? Uh, was it, should have had been attacked? Should you have gone after that? And people don't realize when you're a trial attorney, you have in literally a split second to think, all right, the DA is asking a question. So by the time I have to anticipate what he's going to ask, listen to it, process it, all the information that I already know about the case, how does this fit into the larger strategy of the case? Is it objectionable? Should I object? Or if it is objectionable, does it help me for strategic reasons? Should I not object to it? And then decide how that fits in the big picture all in the matter of seconds. Okay. Right. It can be stressful to the attorney. I know at the end of the day of trial, I'm tired. Yeah. You, I remember you looking over at me, I think after the first day of maybe jury selection, which was, man, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> it is mentally draining. And, 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 you know, looking back at it, Scott, and watching you perform was, uh, I, you definitely had your game face on. So uh, um, it is mentally draining because you're the one. It, you know, the reality is, is like, no matter if you're guilty or innocent, when you're faced with um, that sort of charge in the court of law, and, and, and we know that there's the, the politics, racism, prejudices all play a role in, in that sort of arena, and you being African-American, that is our reality, is that you, we don't just walk away from situations like that. And so... When trial started, the reality was at that time is I'm not ever going home. Um, they're going to find some way somehow to keep me here. And, I'm, and I'll be honest with you, it was even after the verdict and I was went back to my cell and they were processing me out, I didn't I still felt somehow they were going to call me back and say, well, we have new charges. Or, I, I, or, I remember you telling me that concern. Yeah, like, are you yeah. sure there's nothing else yeah. that this is really or over? Something else was going to pop up, or they're not going to charge me with felony acquittal. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And um, um, even the deputies were like, "Man, I've never seen anything like that before." And so, um, it, I, I didn't think that I was walking out of those doors until they actually opened up. And so, let's talk about. Yeah. Jury. Okay. Okay. The county that you resided in has very diverse. It involves several counties, Arapahoe, or I'm sorry, several cities within the county. You've got Aurora, which is very diverse. Right. Um, you have Arapahoe County, uh, the farther south side, mm -hmm. which includes, you know, very upscale neighborhoods, Centennial, right. Cherry Creek, Cherry Hills, a lot of money. Right. Okay. And very law and order type people, right. uh, you know, which is, which is fine. But what, what was going through your head when you saw that potential jury pool sit there? I don't remember seeing a whole lot of, uh, um, African-American faces sitting in that jury pool. Could you think of it, Scott? I don't think there was one. Yeah. There was no African-Americans and somehow we have it in our minds that if you know, if there's an African American on the jury, that he's relatable, he or she is relatable, and it, sometimes that could be the opposite. It's just like um, if it's an African American, he wants to show that he's no longer or nowhere near associated with you in any sort of kind of way. That other than our skin color, we don't have anything in common. So they, it, it could have an adverse effect, and they want any nothing to do with you or or you know don't compare me to him and I, we have a big problem with that amongst our community and our and our, and our ethnicity that we you know sometimes we like to separate ourselves from the good blacks and the bad blacks so so to speak sure uh, um but it was a little daunting to know that there, my entire jury was white um because politics as we know it play a role in the outcome of a lot of verdicts, you know, we, you know, yeah. we're not the biggest prison population for no reason. Sure. Yeah. And so going back in that, I mean, I have lots of clients who are African American or, you know, they're Hispanic and, yeah. you know, they have their jury trial coming up and, you know, they're like, well, I want black jurors. I want this. And, you know, right. And I tell them oftentimes, like, 
I don't think you want that. Right. Because, like you said, not to separate kind of the good people and the right. bad, the right. bad people. Right. But it's you know they sit there, they're doing their jury duty, and they're saying, you know what? I've got my entire life, some fifty, sixty years. I've had hardship. I've had diversity. Uh, you know racism dealt with it exactly. and I've never got myself in trouble. Right. And frankly, I think they're harder on their own race because they're holding themselves to the standard that they perceive. Right. And I find that even if you have a female defendant, you don't want female jurors because females, I mean, they will judge, right. <laughs> you know, up and down and, you know, criticize, Oh, she's wearing that outfit today. I would, you know, they are, they are harsh, but right. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I don't think necessarily having a complete, you know, racial juror of your peers is necessarily a good thing. My experience is none of them say, I'm going to find him guilty or not guilty because, you know, they're African-American or they're Hispanic right. or they're white. They, the jurors, I think, take their jobs very seriously. This is probably one of the most important things that they've ever done in their life. And they realize, particularly in a homicide, first degree murder case, that this is not you know, a DUI where you're going to get probation. We're talking right. serious consequences. And I think that comes to, I think, Scott, that comes down to actually, you know, if you do have a good uh, uh, trial attorney, because, uh, you know, from what I experienced and what I had seen is that the trial attorney really has to explain to the jurors how important their job really is. Um, this is nothing that, you know, you, you have to take a lot of your, your opinions and emotions and a lot of different elements out of the picture and just look at the facts. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the attorneys and our team, you know, did a good job of explaining that to our, the, the jurors. Like, you know, I think even when at one point you said if the facts are there and it shows that Mr. Richards isn't guilty, then find him guilty. I remember you specifically saying that at one point. I, and, <laughs> but you were saying if the facts are not there, then it's your job to find him not guilty based on the facts. Yep. Um, this has nothing to do with race, color, ethnicity, size, or anything. And, and I remember you specifically saying that when they were handed their right uh, during closing arguments. But, um, I, you know, Scott, I, and I don't. In our, in our demographic and in my situation, race didn't play a factor. And I think there was a good job of paint showing me as a human being and not just this, you know, big black African-American scary killer, so to speak. As, no, he has a family that he takes care of. He has a job that he runs. He's active in the community. And I think that that kind of helps soften uh, the approach as to looking at me as a human being rather than sort of some sort of statistic. I don't necessarily think that that may apply in every demographic. If you were in Philadelphia or, um, uh, you know, Charlotte, <laughs> you know. Sure, there's there's obviously you know, there's obviously you know, but in you people. know, middle class is very diverse in Colorado. It's it's fairly liberal, and um, I think in my situation, people really looked at it fairly objectively. And I don't know if you remember this, Scott, but there was only one question about one charge, and we weren't sure. Which way that bounds? I don't know. Yeah, jury that. questions are the worst because you never know what that means. What they're thinking. <laughs> it was they had a question about one charge, and and, and they wanted to um, get a little bit more detail about that one particular charge. So that it, I think that's you know had the hair standing up on her, the back of everyone's neck. Yeah. Well, you know, you you mentioned it. You know, the the jury. Yeah. I still think the selection of the jury is the most important part of any trial because they call that process voir dire. Right. You get to question them and right. coincidentally is the name of this podcast <laughs> voir dire, <laughs> but it's, you know, it means to speak the truth. And I, and I always tell jurors, tell me the truth. Right. I, don't tell me the politically correct answer. Don't tell me the answer you think I want to hear what right. the judge wants to hear. What do you think? Because it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a good juror or, uh, you know, it doesn't mean you're a good person or a bad right. person. It just simply means maybe this isn't the right trial for you. Right. And I've found over the years, if I can get those jurors to say, you know, it's okay. He's, he's, he's honest. He's being honest with me because I want to let them know. Win, lose, or draw at the end of the trial, I at least want to know I had a fair shot. Right. But if you have a bias or a prejudice that is going to make it where I don't even have a shot out of the gate. Right. It's not a fair process at that point. Right. And that's all you can really ask for because let's face it, the jurors that we like, the district attorney will usually get rid of those. <laughs> the jurors that the district attorney loves, we're going to get rid of them. 
And then we're stuck really with this kind of in between. We're not sure where they're going to go, but we hope they take their job seriously because you only get, you know, I think the judge gave us maybe an hour, you know, to interview some 75 potential jurors, which isn't long when you're talking about a case where someone's liberty for the rest of their life is at stake. And I, and I think that's one thing that I liked about when we did the jury selection is that you explained to them that it was their patriotic duty, to, you know, almost like it was a privilege to be able to be served on this on this on this jury. And it, and when you made it seem so patriotic, you know, you know, I think I was looking forward to jury duty. <laughs> you know, this is this was like, one of the first, yeah, and one of the few countries in the world where you get a right to a jury trial. Yeah. You know, in most countries, it's still made before the de- the decision is made before the process starts. Right. And so to think about it, that we trust 12 random citizens from all different backgrounds and different ways of life, you know, jobs, employment, econom- economic, right. economic situations. Right. And guess what? Their one vote counts exactly the same depending on whether they got a Ph.D., or they barely graduated from high school, whether they make a million dollars or they got 10 bucks in their checking account, and it's a total hardship. If you think about the trust that our founding fathers put in the jury system, it's amazing, and it works. Most of the time, the jury gets it correct, because I do believe that the jury takes their job seriously. Think, I mean, if you think about it, we go to court all the time. As Matt and I were attorneys, we go to court. We see juries all the time. Right. Some people are like, oh, it's jury duty. This is a pain in the butt. They should be saying, man, I want to be here. It's an inconvenience, but that man over there with the defendant on his table, that could be me someday or a family member. And yeah, you don't I, want to do it until you're actually <laughs> in that situation where you need a jury. And that's you know, the and thing. You, and you want, as a defendant, I can tell you, you want the jury to take it serious. You want them to pay the attention to everything that's being presented, especially if you feel like you're innocent. You know, um, even if you feel like you're, you know, you're guilty, you still want them to to pay attention and look at you and see you as a human being. And um, everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. Well, I can tell you that as a defense attorney, Scott and I are probably never going to actually end up on a criminal <laughs> jury. <laughs> But I would love to be part of that. It would be so thrilling right. to get that privilege to serve on a criminal jury that I'll yeah. probably never get to do. And I think I'd be a great juror. I think I would I would listen to the evidence and, hey, reasonable doubt or nope. They, yep, they proved it. Right. And, and that's all I would, you know, I, could, I tell people, ladies and gentlemen, it is your oath and obligation. Right. If you think the prosecution has proven their case, find them guilty. That's the way the system works. Right. But on the same token, if you don't think that they've proven their case it's your oath and obligation to say not guilty and that's the way the system works and juries every day in the state of colorado across the country in both state and federal municipal court find people guilty every day yeah. okay it's not some oh i can't believe we're doing this it happens and that's the way it's supposed to work now there's still more guilties than there are not guilties but that's also the way it's kind of set up to work um, it's kind of stacked against you, so to speak, you know. I, I wish more African Americans were in a situation where, um, you know, when they get in trouble and things of that nature. I think, uh, you know, I, and it's just as being me as being black is, I would love to see more of them take their cases to trial, because certain times, you know, certain situations are exaggerated, and um, I would love to see them. But it's the fear, and I think it's a combination of. You know, of pr- oppression. I think it's a combination of a lack lack of education. I think it's a, um, n- they're not familiar with the courtroom or the attorney, and it's definitely the money. Um, as my brother over here is pointing out, um, they, they they don't have the the resources or the finances to 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 go to trial, and um, it's just simply unfortunate. Um, and I think that's why it's so important that if you're in a situation and you do have an attorney, that the attorney does as best he can to make it as personable as he can. Um, because that is the overall consensus is that he doesn't care about me. I'm just a statistic. It's a trust thing. Uh, it's a trust thing. Yeah, he's just a folder. Even if he doesn't have a shot in hell of, of, of 
making it work or getting you out or you're on your fifth DUI or you're on your seventh felony or whatever the case is, still try to make it as personable as you can. It's like, no, I'm here for you. I'm going to fight for you as best I can. Yeah. You know, but I got to be honest with you. And um, um, I think sometimes t- attorneys are so quick to plead out. And, they, and, and that's sort of the norm that goes on when you're in the county jails. Like, oh, they just want to plead everybody out. Their caseload is full. They want to clear their caseload, clear their caseload. And, and, you know, that's just a bad, you know, and that's unfortunate. But it's a reason they think that way. And um, if I already give any advice to any attorney is to try to eliminate that as much as possible, is to convey to your client that, no, I'm really here. We're really going to fight this thing if there's yeah. room to fight. <laughs> yeah. So... Going back to your trial, I remember there was a, a twist near the end where they weren't able to, uh, I think, bring in some records or something along those lines. And although I th- you were prepared to testify, I think it was the last minute, game time, fourth quarter, 30 seconds left on the play clock, we decided, or right. you decided ultimately, but listening to the advice of me. Fourth and nine. <laughs> yeah. To not testify. Right. Now, you know, obviously there's no do-overs in that situation. Was that a scary process? I mean, here you are, I've waited some now 14 months, waiting to tell your story, and then all of a sudden your attorney's saying, I don't think you need to testify. I don't think they've made their case of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's about as basically how you put it to me, and, uh, and I was okay with that decision. Um, I, uh, I was prepared as much as I can um, to testify, but my attitude, by, by day two, day three, my attitude is like I have nothing to lose. So if that was going to be the last um, sort of Hail Mary that I get up there and I testify, then so be it. Um, there was a lot of charges. Uh, it initially, was 13 charges, and one of them would have got me life without parole. And then when, by the time the jury got their instructions, it, 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 it dwindled to nine charges. So if I was not guilty on eight and I got found guilty on the ninth charge, it was life without parole because the, the circumstances of the charges was felony murder. Mm-hmm. And so we had to pretty much beat every charge. They literally had to believe whether you were there or not. Yeah. Is what it came down to. Yeah. And, you know, that decision of do I testify or do not testify, how hard of a decision was that? It was... Uh, I still haven't made that decision <laughs> uh, um, if I would have been okay with doing it or not. Um, but like I said, it was like um, I took the advice of my counsel. He said, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think we need to get up there. But Lily, and if you do happen to get up there, I trust and believe that you can represent yourself very well. And I, and I took to that, and he didn't think that it was necessary to do it. So... You know, part of like well, like we said in the beginning, part of it's trust. So you have to have the, the attorney has to be able to trust that you're telling him everything that he needs to know, and you're, the defendant and the client has to be able to trust that the attorney really is there working for you on your behalf. Yeah, yeah we talked earlier about how stressful it is for attorneys in a case. Yeah, that is one of the most stressful decisions because. What if I made the wrong decision? What if I gave the wrong advice? Right. You know, it's a tactical right. decision. You're making the best decision you can at the time, seeing what the jurors are thinking, their their reactions, their body language, how's the evidence presenting, stuff that doesn't read if you just read a, a, a transcript. Right. So you have to kind of be there in the moment thinking, I don't think you've proven it. You know, and you can't tell from the jurors, right? They're not saying, you know, holding up scorecards like, oh, that question was an eight. That was right. a nine. Uh, you know, a little too much splash. It's a six. You don't, get, <laughs> you, you don't get any do-overs and there's no, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, um, you can't rewind it. And so it, it unfolds right in front of your eyes as is. Um, and I'm sure the district attorney would love to get a do-over. Um, and you know, it, you know, it did bounce the ball and bounce his way. And, and that's, that, you're exactly right. And so, it was it was really scary, man. And uh, I remember when the when the when they we all finally rest and we were waiting on the verdict to come in. Uh, Scott, I don't know if you remember this, man, but you were you you were shaking. <laughs> and I and, and I remember asking you, and I remember telling you, Scott, no matter what what the verdict is and how it come out, I, you know, I, I, I 
I'm glad you represented me. And you, you know, I, I am very impressed on, on the performance that you gave. And um, I feel confident that, that I was represented in the right way. And all that sound good, but he said at the end, he said, Lee, then they didn't prove it. They didn't prove it. And I think uh, Scott said at one point, he's like, Lee, I'll quit the bar. And I'll quit the practice if they found you guilty on this case. He's like, and he was just, he didn't even look at me. He's just like, you know, he just kept shaking his head and rocking back and forth. He's like, they just didn't prove it. And and that showed me right then and there that he he gave me all the blood, sweat, and tears and all the information and all. He, he pulled out all the stops to, yeah. you know, and... And Danny and Lindsay, who were the private investigators on the case, too, they were very vested, and I think they liked me, you know? And so <laughs> I think that helped, you know? And so, uh, you know, I, I I feel so blessed. You know how to tell people all the light? Like, he really, truly, genuinely saved my life. So, obviously, the jury was out. Yeah. I think they asked one or two questions, not many. Right. But, of course, you never know exactly what each question means. Uh, ultimately... Jury comes out. I think they had a stand. I can't remember if this judge did. But they read the verdict. And I think remember thinking, well, if it's not guilty on the first one or guilty, it's going to be guilty or not guilty all the way down. No splitting the babies. They either believed it or they didn't. Or they didn't, right. And they went through, and it was all not guilties. And yeah. I think I remember you hugging, reaching over and, like, gr- hugging me or something. I'm yeah. like, hold on, hold on. We're not done all the way yet. Right. <laughs> uh we got down to the, the, the eighth charge, and, and the celebration kicked in, and, you know, you know like hugs and kisses. And they, but they went, so, what, so what's scary is, you know, they, you know, you know Leland Richardson versus the state of Colorado, um, we find a defendant on the charges of first-degree <laughs> murder. <laughs> Not, and I mean, it's just long and drawn, and it's just really scary. And so you're just sitting there. You know, um, and I don't think we asked for at this point. I don't think we asked for any lesser included. I think we were thinking they either they either believe yeah, it or they don't. Yeah. Bring it on. I think they went to second degree on the lesser included. Okay, maybe that's. Yeah, I think they went to second degree for the lesser included charge at, at that point. And it, I mean, it, it felt like it took an hour to read that verdict. And uh, by the time we got to the eighth one, we we were confident that we we won, and so. Um, I think even Scott at that point still in the eighth charge, he was like, no, wait, 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 wait. wait. And, Don't get too excited yet. Yeah. They got more to go. Yeah, right. As soon as you start celebrating, you'll get some bad news. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so um, I don't even think I even remember hearing the last not guilty charge. And I can't remember exactly because it's been so long and done a lot of trials in between. But I can't remember if your family was able to make it back for the verdict because I remember... My immediate family was there, mom, my, my mother, uh, mother, father, brother, uh, my nephew and stuff. But there was a lot of family members there. Okay. I, I, I couldn't to. recall. Sometimes there were, you know, they, there's not yeah. much time from to get the verdict because they don't want to hold the jurors up. Right. Because I remember. It was quick. Yeah. yeah. And because um, they want to get people along their way. Right. And it was two and a half hours. Once the jury got their instruction, it was two and a half hours to come up with a verdict. Which is a quick, pretty quick verdict for a homicide case with nine charges ultimately yeah. submitted to them. So that was well for going, you. Yeah, I, went, I remember going back to my cell and laying down and literally getting ready to doze off, and they're like, oh, they got the verdict saying, let's go. And I'm like, what? <laughs> remember what I told you? You said, I, and I get this question quite a bit, like, what's the worst part? I'm like, oh, this waiting is the second worst part of a trial. Yes. Waiting. Yeah. The worst part is when they say, we have a verdict. Right. And you... Like, is it going to be five minutes? Is it going to be 15? Are we waiting for families from victims to arrive? Is it going to be an hour and 50 minutes? Right. And you're just saying, like, it's just the worst. It's the worst. And, you know. And getting that question, what does that mean? Yeah, exactly. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> and so you're there. Obviously, you were found not guilty. Never been in any trouble since. Right. You know, that. what was that like when... You know, obviously, you're still in custody at that right. point, so they have to process you out. So right. they still put you in shackles, right? Yeah, they put you in shackles. You go, as a matter of fact, you go back to your cell, and you know they give you lunch, and and you're still an inmate. And uh, uh, as, as a matter of fact, I remember this distinctly. Uh, the, it ended at four o'clock, so we got our verdict in by four, 
and I wasn't processed and released till seven o'clock later on that night. So you still have those three hours where it was just dreadful. Still, it, it was so, uh, it, I, it was surreal. I didn't believe it um, until the doors opened up and it was still kind of light outside because it was July. But, um, it, it, you know, and I got a little angry. I, I, had to be, I have to be honest with you. I was very angry because, you know, it was one of those things like I felt blessed and I'm glad I was going home. But I also felt a part of me felt like it shouldn't even gone that far. And so to go home and pick up the pieces and put everything back together and, you know, you get upset because it's just like, man, you know, like I told you so sort of attitude. Like, sure. You know, you spent 14 months waiting. Yeah, you spent 14 months waiting and you know you're innocent. You know, you didn't play the part that they said that you played. And it was just like, see, I told you. And, and you know, and it's just unfortunate. And, and, you know, and it, you know, it took a big toll out of me. And I don't think, you know, part of me will never be the same. But I am happy that that I had the attorney that I had, that I had the team that I had and the support. And, and you know, was, <laughs> I mean, I can't say enough about Scott even when he's not around. I speak wow. so highly of him. Well, that's that's very kind of you, but had we lost, that would have been the biggest bag of trash around. I, you know what? I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I really believe that because, man, when I, what I seen at court and what I seen at trial was night and day compared to what I had seen through all the preliminary process. So uh, it was like, you know, I didn't see much. He didn't, he didn't say much. He didn't object to much. He I didn't, didn't have to jump up and down. There wasn't anything to jump up yeah, and down about, right? You know, but, but once you gotta, we got into court, it was like right. game on. It was game on. We were talking about, you know, stepping out, your family being supportive and things like that. You said you nearly lost everything and you were able to re, rebuild. How long did it take to, first of all, get used to it? Did it feel real? I mean... Here you were sitting in jail every day, maybe yeah. hanging out, watching TV, reading your case discovery. Yeah. All of a sudden now, bam, you're back in the world. Right. How was that adjustment? Even after, I mean, 14 months. We're not talking 14 years. We're talking 14 months. It was difficult. Um, it was very difficult, very emotional. Um, 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 almost like fade a launch. It, it, it became very difficult in the beginning to get up and even take a shower. Um, sleeping in your own bed was uncomfortable. Um, uh, you know, putting back the pieces, um, it ruined my relationship that I had. I was in a relationship, seven year relationship. It ruined that. Um, um, it played, um, a very, took a big toll on my family, um, because, um, they helped as much as they could, you know, so it drained everybody and you almost got to come out and just like, you kind of, you know, your family's there and they help you out, but it's almost like you got to pay them back, so to speak. And it, not in a monetary situation, but they want, you know. Uh, they want you to show some appreciation want, for what they you, want what they've done. They gratitude. And they don't understand why you're not your old self like you used to be. And so that was difficult to make the adjustments. Um, I run a business. I came back. Half my staff was gone. The other half was brand new. They had never met me. And so they're working at my place of business, but they don't even know who I am. And so um, uh, that was difficult um, to make that sort of adjustment. And um, I, like I said, I came home and I was very angry because I'm, a, I'm a, you know, part of it was like, why am I, why did I go through this? Why, you know, you still, I still ask myself why, um, why, why did this transpire? And, um, you know, like I said, I lost my house. I lost half my business. I lost my relationship. And, it, and you know, you go through this, why me? But then you have a moment of clarity and you just says, you know what, it is what it is, and you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and you do it all over again. And I can be honest with you, man, I'm probably uh, uh, doing ten times better than I was ten years ago, you know. And I've always, always been fairly tenacious and pretty financially responsible, and making pretty good decisions. And you know, I can honestly say, you know, not to get on a spiritual kick, but I was blessed ten times over since I've been home. What did you learn through the process? Did you learn anything about friends, who you hang out with, taking that deep breath and let it go, anything like that? Man, you have to keep your mouth shut. I don't care how <laughs> That is the biggest thing that is so hard to convey. I mean, people watch TV and watch First 48 and Crime Scene Investigator, and you don't understand how big it is. Guilty or innocent is that, and I just, I just have to say it, the police are just simply not on your side. 
They're not. They're there to do a job. They're there to paint a picture. They're there to simply extort you for whatever it's worth. Um, and I and I believe that, and I'm always going to stick by it. And I think the biggest thing is just remaining quiet and letting your team and your your your, your attorney do the talking for you is the biggest outcome. As the it, that that had everything to do with it. Um, I could have went in there and, 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 and confessed my innocence, and I think that it would have changed the outcome of the case. Um, um, they, it, th that's the biggest thing that I probably learned in all this. And just in terms of friends and you know your relationships, um, that definitely changes. But I think that also comes with just age and growing up and just growing pains. Is, um, uh, um, some friends that definitely showed me who was around and who had my back and some of them, you know, you have friends and family members that are equally envious of you. So I think it's important to change your circle as you get older and as you go through certain trials and tribulations. Now, obviously, this case was in the news, the newspaper right. at the time, and they covered everything. Did you ever get any retaliation or anybody publicly try to say something to you like, Oh, there's, there's Lee. He's, you know, he was charged with murder. Anything along those lines? No, I was actually waiting for it. Um, uh, I, it's crazy because, uh, most of the people just felt that I was going to come home, you know, even though I didn't feel that way. And, you know, a lot of people were like, yeah, Lee, you know, and, and, and you know, we knew you pulled through. Um, the ones that didn't believe that, I never seen or heard from them again. So um, there was no retaliation. Um, it made it difficult at first because when you're dating, um, you know, in the age of social media. <laughs> oh, by the way, just happened to see you had this yes. case pending. You had anything so, you want to tell me about? That was very embarrassing because, like, when you meet a girl or when you're dating or anything, first thing they want to do is just look you up on Facebook. Well, quick Google search these days, yeah, huh? Yeah, man, you get a Google shirt, and all of a sudden it comes up with all this, you know, this, 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 you know, demonstrative information. It's just like um, it's, it gets embarrassing. Now, I, I can remember twice where I've had to explain myself when I didn't want to. You know, it's just like, well, Lee, what is this about? I seen this on you, and you know, you seem like a nice guy, but. You By know. the way, anything you want to talk to me about? Exactly. Anything should I be worried? And I've been in those situations. How am I going to take you home and introduce you to mom? Exactly. And that, that was tough. That was tough in the beginning. Now I really don't care as much. Um, but, you know, your reputation is, is everything. And uh, especially when you're well-known in the community, um, it made it very difficult. I did lose some friends who didn't want to associate. One just happened to be an attorney who actually I got the information of, of, of um, where I got Scott's information from. And uh, he helped me through the process, but then after it was done, he was like, I don't want anything else to do with you. It's you unfortunate. Know? Yeah. So kind of wrapping up here, obviously you've been through, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of to hell and back. Yeah. Fortunately, it wasn't one of those situations where someone's convicted and then it gets found out, discovered later that they're the wrong person after they spend 10, 20, 30 years in prison. Right. You know, the system, in my opinion it worked the way it's supposed to work. And a lot of people don't have a whole lot of faith in the American judicial system, but I do. Right. For somebody that does it every day, done hundreds of jury trials, right. I truly believe the jury usually gets it right. right. They really do. Now, there's been a couple of cases I sit there and scratch my head thinking, what are you people thinking? <laughs> but that's their prerogative. They're the jury. Okay, right. they For whatever reason, they thought through it. Um, and I'm never going to second guess them in that sense. Okay. Right. Cause usually they go in my favor when they scratch my head, <laughs> but you know, you as an African American man who's yeah. been charged literally, you know, facing spending the rest of your life in prison, but found not guilty by an all white jury right. in a very conservative jurisdiction. And I don't want to make it sound like that's the only thing that matters, but let's face it. There are biased people out there. There are racist people out there. Right. But I think for the most part, uh, most Americans are pretty fair yeah. and they want to be treated. They want to treat people the way they want to be treated. And they're going to look at every person, 
you know, kind of going back to Martin Luther, you're not going to be judging you in the, the um, color of your skin, but the content of your character. character. And I truly believe that in most people. Are there going to be people on each end of the spectrum that, um, that it doesn't matter? You know, I'm going to find him guilty or not guilty because he's an African-American. I'm sure those people, but for the most part, those people get discovered in that process of voir dire, uh, and we get them out of there. Um, but how would you rate, or what's your faith in the judicial system? Obviously, it works for you, but you know, there's cases where it doesn't work. How would, how would you rate it, say on a scale of one to ten? Oh, man, that is, that's pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just being African American because so many of us are locked up, and even though I know a lot of them don't go to trial, um, you know, I, I even look at the high profile cases like the O.J. Simpsons and the Bill Cosby as of late, and uh, um, you know, those you, it's it, it's it's tough. It did work in my situation. Um, I, I think there's a, of course a lot to improve still, and I think it does a lot, a lot of times come down to money. And not everybody's granted, um, you know, sort of the the olive branch that you gave me when I ran out of money and you still decided to stay on my cave and represent me. That simply just doesn't happen. Yeah, we were fortunate because there was a co-defendant whose case was ultimately dismissed after right. your trial. Right. Uh, but he had the public defender. So I was able to go to our Office of Alternate Defense Counsel and say, we're a month before trial. Right. He's going to get ADC counsel instead of waiting. So it's another 14 months of you waiting in custody. Will you appoint me so that I can finish this case? And they did. Right. And, and frankly, you know, the uh, less than exorbitant state rates wasn't that much. Obviously, I would have preferred you to pay me privately. But for the reality <laughs> of it is, most people can't pay for a private homicide. That's just the reality, the reality because yeah. you have to leave no stone unturned investigate, research, and you just never know. Right. Um, you know, not to speak out of school, but we just had one, and uh, it ultimately didn't even go to trial, and we're talking six figures. Wow. You know, I mean, you have a team of attorneys, investigators, expert witnesses. You know, it's a lot of money. Right. Because, but you have to pay it. <laughs> right. Um be, to get the best representation, to, you can you to can get the best representation, and you know to get your story told. Yeah, you know it, it's gonna cost. You know, um, and that's the unfortunate thing about it. But I think you remember. I remember you telling me one time, Scott, when we were talking about politics, and you're like, you know, Leland, with all the prejudices and the discrimination that go on in our judicial system, it's about as equal as gonna get compared to any other place. Because I think at one point I was like, man, I'm gonna move out the country, and it's just like. Man, it doesn't get any better. I, uh, this I tell, is about I, as equal in, in, <laughs> as it's going to get. And, and I really, and I never, it resonated with me, and I never forgot that. And I was just like, you know, as, as, as much as I have, you know, with the, with the judicial system, I think this is probably the best one we're going to get so far. There is a great quote, and I think it hits home. The American judicial system is absolutely terrible but it's still better than anywhere else in the world. Right. And I truly, truly believe that because from the start of the process, from charges filing to whether it's a guilty plea or there is a jury trial, right. the truth or a pretty darn close version of it comes out, and that's because of the, con the adversarial system that we have in our court system. It's right. not perfect, but I still think right. it's better than anywhere else in the world. Right. So that being said... Right. You didn't give me your rating of scale one to ten. Well, the, well the, 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 just to elaborate, the reason why it's so difficult difficult to rate it, uh, Scott, is because when I still see, um, you know, we having this big thing now in the in, in the media with Black Lives Matter, and you know, a lot of um, police officers are shooting um, innocent or unarmed black men and women, and then they go to court. And I know a lot of times, you mentioned a few times the jury always gets it right, but a lot of times these people aren't even brought up on charges. And so it's just like, you know, how fair is it? Because, you know, we're getting killed in the street here. And, uh, and you know, it's judicially it's not bouncing in our, in our favor. And I think if police officers were being held accountable more in court, that it would sort of, um, I would hope that it would deter a lot of the innocent shootings that have been going on. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, there was that officer yeah. in South Carolina that was on videotape right. where they shot the guy in as the he's back. running away in the in back. The back. Right. And 
the jury hung, I think, in the state the court, hung, right. but he took a deal in the federal court because he probably wasn't going to get that same jury pool, exactly. the local neighborhood one. Right. So I agree. I, you know, it's like most professions. Most people, right. I think, are going to show up and do the right job. Right. The problem with the police is um, if there's a bad apple, yeah, they never get rid of that bad apple. They right. defend it because, they don't, well, if we go after the bad apple, then they may have to get rid of a guy who maybe not be a bad apple, but maybe has a little bit of a, a bruise on him. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because if they can't hold themselves to a higher standard as a police officer, they should go. Right. So I appreciate you taking the time today. Um, Difficult to rate. Uh, the <laughs> for me, I give it a 10 because I'm home. Because it worked for you. Because it worked for me. But, it's, um, but on a larger scale, you know, you know, in, in, just in America, it, it's difficult to scale because I still see a lot of injustices going on. And uh, uh, But for me, I mean, 1 to 10, it worked as a 10. My team, the way things have transpired, the, things, the way things opened up. Um, um, and I'm home at the end of the day, and I feel like I should be. And... Uh, uh, I, I can't speak any other, I can't, you know, when I talked to Scott and the Reich Law Firm and everybody was so attentive and everybody was available and everybody played their position and their role and, and, and it worked, it worked. Um, and I hope that it continues to work for those who are less fortunate. Uh, once again, Leland, I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. You're, uh, you know, the... I guess the first real guest for our <laughs> podcast, Voir Dire. Uh, but you will be the first, and we'll put this out here. It'll be on the website, uh, voidir.com, okay. the reichlawfirm.com, scottreich.com on YouTube. So okay. this will be on as well. So subscribe, you know, I will. I will. watch it many, many times, all right? Absolutely. I want to see how this turns out, and I hope I wish you all the best. And your continued success, and I hope the podcast continues to flourish. All right, flourishes, and uh, and have me back, man. I will. Yeah, we got a lot back. to talk about. Yeah, we can talk about all kinds of stuff. We can talk about politics, man. We can talk about anything. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Broncos. Let's do it. The Broncos, go Broncos. All right, all right. Thanks, Leland. Thank you. <laughs>